Indians just walked up to me during lunch and said, thank you, Rashmi, for inviting me to Sankal. This has been very exciting. And I said, I hope the sessions were enriching. He quickly turned around and said, oh, no, I haven't attended even a single one of them. But I made sure I was there for every coffee and every lunch break. The conversations there were more exciting. So ladies and gentlemen, four coffee breaks later, and after two lunches, I hope Sankal was as exciting for you as it was for this gentleman. Taking risks and investing early, supporting the startup entrepreneur. A little explanation on how this panel came about. Pooja Warrior from Unlimited, Pankaj Jain and Neera Nandi literally coerced me into having this panel together. She said that there isn't a perspective of intermediaries and facilitators at Sankal. So here's the panel for intermediaries and facilitators. Dasra Unlimited, Intellicap, and many others are working directly with startup social enterprises. And through this panel, we hope to bring their perspectives as well. Before I introduce this panel, many of you must have noticed these flyers. Can we zoom on this? So these flyers on your seats outlining challenges from a financing and non-financing perspective. This is in conjunction with a project that IntelliCap has been working with FCO on policies affecting first generation entrepreneurs in India. We would appreciate your feedback. You can notice these circles. So if you could just take the challenges that your company faces according of, in accordance of importance, um, I think the team there would appreciate your feedback. Also, thank you. a big thank you to FCO for supporting this panel discussion and Unlimited for being there. Um, one second. Moderated by Atreya Raya Prolu, co-founder IntelliCap and head of IntelliCap's investment banking arm, we have quite a heavyweight, hard-hitting panel here with us. Randall Kempner, executive director, Andy, or Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. Rajesh Sharma, head marketing development, head of marketing uh, brand capital. Richard Alderson, co-founder and director, Unlimited India. Gaurav Mehta, CEO and founder, Project Dharam Gajam India. Neera Nandi, co-founder, Dasra. Pankaj Jain, principal, Impact Law Ventures. And last but not the least, Vinod Keni, C CFO of Avishkar. Atre, I know it's tough. We just have one hour, but we're sure you can do it. Rashmi, uh, thanks a lot for setting the expectations right up front. I'm quite happy to find a lot of them still continuing in the room. And uh, uh, she's given me a pretty tough job. We have one hour, so I'm not going to waste any time uh, on introductions or any further introductions of the work that each person is doing. Uh, I have made certain assumptions here to, uh, to moderate this discussion. And uh, I hope that the flyers that have been placed uh, are going to help in, uh, in, in making this discussion as productive and fruitful as possible. So uh, the discussion was uh, expected to be on the challenges that these startup entrepreneurs face. And uh, we have kind of uh, zeroed in on specific challenges that, that most startup entrepreneurs face based on our experiences in our, in our different work streams. And uh, broadly, what we've done is to bucket them into, uh, into a couple of categories. And uh, those are divided into financing and non-financing, which you can actually uh, see in the flyers that have been circulated. Uh, and we're going to focus specifically on uh, specific aspects of the financing requirements of a startup entrepreneur and uh, whether there are any solutions that exist today in the market, whether global or in India, and if some of these solutions can actually be adopted by the Indian market, if they do not exist. Uh, <coughs> then uh, uh, I would like to move on to the non-financing challenges that most entrepreneurs face. Uh, how do the, or the entrepreneurs uh, scale uh, uh, with or without access to capital? And are there enough support systems and market infrastructure uh, that is available today in the market to, to help uh, these entrepreneurs scale up and access further capital to, to, to make further impact? Uh, then we move from there to uh, making suggestions on the policy side and to explore if there are any options that, are, uh, that we can uh, work on with the government, which can enable uh, and uh, make a more robust entrepreneurship ecosystem within the, within the social enterprise space. So I'll quickly start off uh, with the 
uh, financing requirements and essentially the challenges that most startup entrepreneurs face on the financing side. And, uh, uh, and I'll start off with my own experience on the investment banking side. I have been, uh, we have been dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs for the, for the past seven years uh, who have been raising capital. And on the other side, dealt with a lot of uh, investors. And uh, what we've seen in the last five to seven years is a natural progression that most investors make. Uh, so just like our own career paths, we kind of graduate to one level, from one level to the next. Uh, most investment banks actually look at uh, doing transactions that are as large as possible. Similarly, most investors are actually looking at uh, uh, doing transactions that are as large as possible. So they move from one, si one fund size to the next and graduate uh, from one fund size to the other. I have, uh, amongst the panelists here, I have Vinod Kenny, who represents Avishkar, one such fund, uh, which has graduated from being a $1.3 million fund, looking at micro-equity investments, looking at startup entrepreneurs, and uh, which has graduated from the $1.3 million to $18 million to a $70 million first closing. And uh, they're now talking about a $150 million Avishkar too. So, I would uh, like to specifically ask a question to Vinod and uh, related to the kind of enterprises that they actually look at and how it has actually evolved over time and uh, the expertise that they've gained in identifying social entrepreneurs and rural entrepreneurs and if their natural evolution of the fund has actually led them to uh, I mean, kinds of investments which are, which are not really startup heavy. So, uh, Thanks, Atreya. I know we have a tough challenge in trying to keep you guys awake right after uh, lunch, but, but we'll try and make it uh, as entertaining and as informative as possible. Yeah, I mean, most funds, they start off by being small funds and, and gradually, you know, they sort of migrate to becoming much larger funds, no doubt about it. Uh, in, in our experience, we've also seen that there are, you know, entrepreneurs who also become more sophisticated and start looking at higher amounts of capital to start off with. but. Having said that, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that, you know, the the bottom, which is where you know most of the smaller uh, or the early stage startup entrepreneurs look for capital, which is the smaller amounts of capital that's required, is completely absent or completely vacant. As we as funds migrate and move up, that space gets taken again by other entrepreneurs and other fund managers who actually come and take up that space by going out and raising smaller funds and starting off doing the same thing that Avishkar or any of the other funds are, were doing earlier. So classic example, I've seen several funds in the last few days, which are all anywhere from five to 10 million, focus more or less on the same space that Avishkar is, you know, rural and micro enterprises, social impact. So yes, there is a challenge in terms of finding early stage, you know, uh, startup money, but at the same time, I don't think that space is completely vacant there is enough opportunity and enough funds out there that are now looking at making investments and enough of them out there that are also going out and raising capital in that space to actually make investments in micro and, and rural enterprises. Thanks, Vinod. I'm not very sure if the audience here and a lot of entrepreneurs here in the audience will, will agree to that. I think they're still looking for capital and they've been looking for capital for, for a long time now. No, that, that is, I think, always going to be the challenge. Uh, entrepreneurs, we're always out there always trying to find more capital. Um, at the flip side of it, there are always going to be funds that are always trying to deploy capital. But at some point, I think the twain will meet. Sure. So there is a corollary to the question, which is uh, that of uh, uh, that posed by most investors that we meet, that there aren't really enough enterprises out there in the market which are uh, good enough. And uh, that there is, uh, that, that we require a larger ecosystem and, and far more infrastructure to help these enterprises and the entrepreneurs become investor ready. Uh, so would someone else in the panel want to address uh, and take this corollary as well? And, and uh See, uh, obviously, as uh, Vinod said, uh, you know, so there is this uh, divide between funds are available, but people who are looking out for funds, they don't find funds, right? And I think a large part of it uh, lies with the fact that, and both, both are factually true, okay, that there are a lot of funds available, and still, there we are in a situation that funds are not available when entrepreneurs, especially in the starting stages, want to raise funds. Okay, but what is the, what is the problem here? The problem here is the disconnect of understanding that what the investors want. Okay, so we've evaluated so many uh, proposals, and we see that 
the uh, as as like when you start a business, when you set a, start an enterprise, right? The product that you make, you make it by understanding the customer. What does the customer need, right? Unfortunately, entrepreneurs are very good at doing that. That what is the product I should make which will appeal to the customer, but the lack when it comes to that what is the business plan I should make which will appeal to the investor. Okay, so that that is a big uh, disconnect. See, we must get one fundamental point right. That what is it that the investor is looking for? Investor is looking for a business which makes money, right? And from which he can make money. So two things you need to plan out for that: how you are going to make money year on year in a scalable manner, right? That that plan has to be made and communicated very clearly, right? And what is the exit route that tomorrow the investor will have in this? Most of the business plans that we receive, you know, they kind of fall short on uh, these two things, right? Because the promoters or the entrepreneurs are so passionate about the business that they are doing that a lot of times they uh, forget that it is also their business to be able to sell that investment story to the investors. Okay, so the format in which you make your business plan, the scalability of the vision. So if you go to an investor with saying that okay, I have a, I'm planning for opening four shops, but those four shops will be very highly profitable, the investor is not so much interested because it's not a scalable business plan, right? So you say that I am starting out with four shops, but I'll go pan India, right? And these are the kind of turnovers eventually in five years, seven years I'll achieve. That's a far more scalable and exciting vision for the investor to buy into, right? Point number one. Second, that uh, most of the people still want to uh, get a very tight control over the business, so they do not employ. Uh, in the very uh, beginning stage, I think it is very essential to employ professional staff. So, like as I normally say. Uh, the way to build a scalable modern business today is on three pillars. One is obviously the basic business that you're doing. Second pillar is that your business should also have the capability to align to the capital markets. So look for within the organization, do you have a CFO on board? Do you have an investment banker on board who's going to help you package your business from the capital markets perspective and hence tune you more to the financial investors, right? And thirdly, every investor will look for what is the uh, sales that you are able to do. So do you have a marketing person, a CMO on board who will also drive your sales strategy? Okay. So what we call as depth and width of the management. So these few things in the very starting stage you have to take care of and treat your investor also as your customer and not ju just your customer as customer. And then we'll see that the divide between the investors and the people who are wanting to raise money, it will narrow down significantly. and the situation that they are not able to raise money will get addressed. Sure, sure, Rajesh. So we know the, what you have said is that there are enough investors out there, and if there is a gap being created, there will be further more investors coming in, both institutional and individuals will yeah. fill that will fill that gap. And uh, Rajesh, you talked about the uh, the need for enterprises to become more investor ready. We have uh, Gaurav amongst us. Uh, he has been an investment banker in the past understands the buy side, understands the sell side, he has been the investor as well, and managed investments, and now a social entrepreneur himself. So I'll want to uh, ask Gaurav if that's been his experience and, if, uh, and, and what's been his challenge uh, while running a social enterprise, and if capital has been a challenge or not. Thanks, Satya. So from our perspective, I think if I look at both perspectives, you know, investors, investment capital being available, as well as you know, there's a gap between entrepreneurs you know, not being ready for, you know, traditional VC money. I, I think, you know, there's another angle to it from my perspective. The, the angle is the social investment side is generally more difficult. So I think, you know, operating mod models, be it a private limited, be it a, you know, a non-profit, be it a section 25, we'll get to that in a later section of this panel, is, um, is an issue because, you know, the capital which is available, I sometimes feel there's a mission conflict quite often on the fund side where you know, it's, it's clear that the model has to be sustainable and scalable, but especially in the social enterprise space, the periods for that, that to happen are much longer than in, the social, than in the normal VC space, number one. And number two, I think you know, the, the struggles a social entrepreneur faces are much beyond um, capital, because even uh, the capital, I mean, even the human side, we'll get to that later, is, is a big issue. But uh, you know, from my, I think what did we face when we started off? We had an idea, we ha had to iterate it so often that I think if we would have raised VC capital, we would not have been able to iterate that often to get to a model which works. 
So I think uh, you know there's a gap because if you look at most of the social VC funds, you know I think um, I would say that their missions uh, there's there's a lot of d problems around aligning the mission of a true social mission with a sustainable model, especially at the beginning. And I think that's uh, it's a slightly controversial comment, and I but I feel that currently most VC models are just uh, are very I mean the definition of social return is just not clear yet. I mean it. There's a lot of approaches, but I feel there's a huge gap to be addressed, and especially in the social VC space, that's the case. Yeah. So thanks, Gaurav. I think that's uh, homework for VCs and especially social VCs to figure out what the what the metrics are. And I think there is ongoing debate and discussion on that subject. Uh, but but on the specific, uh, so while we'll move towards the other uh, uh, capacity building related challenges slightly later. Just staying on with the capital-related challenges for the moment, uh, would you look at? Uh, do you think there are enough alternatives available in the market to equity? And we have looked at the availability of debt in the market today, and uh, uh, venture philanthropy, which which is a pretty uh, largely spoken term in the West. So, uh, Richard, would you want to speak a little bit about some of the other alternatives that exist today in the market? Um. So. The model that we run at Unlimited India is really about strategically using small amounts of philanthropic capital to uh, accelerate the progress of social entrepreneurs working across all different business models, including social enterprise. Um, and the, the topic of this panel is um, taking risks and investing very early. Um, we're really at the early, early, early stage um, at concept and pilot and um, early growth stage of, of a social entrepreneur's life cycle. And uh, we try to take a lot of risks at that stage. Um, as any of the, the people in later stage funds will testify, taking risks is expensive. And so our model for doing that is really to bring in different types of capital. So raise essentially uh, institutional donor donations to support our work and then put that money into social enterprises in debt form, but also pay with philanthropic capital for the support alongside that to minimize the risk of um, the ventures just not working. So um, up, up to this point, we've supported uh, th about 30 social enterprises. We've been going about four years. And uh, of those, about 75% are still running. And in terms of the kind of leverage that we're seeing, we're seeing about for every rupee that we're investing, that each social enterprise is going on to raise about 14 further rupees. So something is working, albeit at early stages. Thanks, Richard. Uh, and uh, Pankaj, would you like to add on to uh, the existing instruments in India? And if, I mean, there are enough debt alternatives that exist in the market today. Yeah. Uh, so since the uh, theme of this panel session is very aptly taking risks and investing early, uh, I'm a big fan of angel investment. Uh, it is typically at the life cycle of the, the stage at which your enterprise is, whether you're social or anti-social, I'm not going to discriminate on that. Uh, <laughs> that's a different ideological debate altogether. But I, I think angel investment, when it comes from friends, family, fools, uh, father-in-law, uh, or from even institutionalized angel investment mechanisms, and you have a bunch of institutionalized uh, angels of late, Mumbai Angels, Indian Angel Network. I think that existence of a robust angel uh, funding ecosystem is very much required for allowing enterprises to succeed and thrive. And what is right now happening in India, at least in my opinion, is it's at an extremely nascent stage. We are fast evolving, uh, but we are still nascent. I don't see enough angel uh, investment, at least in the social enterprise space. In the hardcore for-profit space, be it tech deals or other exciting products, I'm seeing actually a lot of avid angel interest. But social enterprise, there is not much of angel uh, uh, act, uh, participation that I'm seeing. Uh, even domestic capital in the angel space within the social enterprise space, it's practically negligible. Uh, and what is also lacking right now is what I like to call a market maker. There is no market maker right now which is in play for allowing angels to invest uh, with you know a kind of a philosophy that, OK, all said and done, there is a credible exit at the end of it all, which will allow me to recycle the capital at the end of it all. Uh, so I think uh, probably looking at angel funding uh, and having a kind of a aspiration to have that kind of a money maker, a market maker, 
uh, which will allow for creation of a much more robust ecosystem is uh, something I'd say uh, I'll be more excited about. So have you seen enterprises or, I mean, funding opportunities here in India which have experimented? Uh, in terms of angel or more than angel, uh, any other alternatives? Uh, there are a lot of uh, other alternatives around revenue sharing, uh, surplus cash sweep, uh, but not, nothing which I'm seeing at scale. It's more of a one-off experiment uh, that I'm seeing about uh, uh, people coming on board, offering services, uh, investing time also uh, in addition to services. Uh, but in a manner of speaking, the conventional classes, I will still say, are equity, debt, and grants. Sure. So, so we have seen a lot of entrepreneurs actually face uh, a tremendous challenge in, in going and, and being convinced in actually raising equity. Far more uh, want to access debt and uh, while there isn't enough innovation required from, uh, I mean, from the point of view of creating further instruments in the market, I think there is enough knowledge in the market that exists globally. It seems like uh, there, is, there isn't enough risk appetite in the market today for people uh, to start up enterprises on the financing side and use existing instruments. And uh, uh, we have seen in the recent past uh, certain NBFCs like Kinara, Intelligro, Others provide venture debt, etc. So we do see that as an opportunity for other players in the market to come in and participate in, in innovative, in more innovative structures, other than uh, plain vanilla equity. Uh, so, so venture debt and uh, venture philanthropy seem seem quite viable options. Uh, so I would uh, like to move on from the financing challenges here and and start uh, looking at some of the other non-financing challenges that Gaurav had also referred to. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to specifically, I mean, talk about a certain stat that, uh, that, that's that been uh, pointed out in the US. So a study by the Inc. Magazine and uh, the National Business Incubator Association uh, reveals that around 80% of the businesses in the US uh, fail within the first five years. 52% of them fail because of management-related issues, and 48% of them failed because of lack of capital. Now, uh, when associated with an incubator of some form, and there are around 1,400 incubators in the US, uh, there are uh, around 300 business incubators in the UK, uh, around 120, I think, technology business incubators today in India. So when associated with any of those 1,400 business incubators in the US, 87% was the survival rate. So it seems to show a certain uh, a certain change in the profile of the company as soon as you start associating with an incubator of some form. So uh, having Randall here and uh, Neera, I would first pose a question to Neera. Uh, what kind of, uh, I mean, so, so what do you think of the incubator ecosystem here in India? And uh, uh, in terms of the non-incubator ecosystem, external support and market infrastructure, what kind of capacity building activities do help entrepreneurs in, in your experience what have you found helping those entrepreneurs in your work? Um, so, so I think everybody knows that the ecosystem is weak. And in general, there are not enough incubators to support the organizations and provide the right kind of support for many of the organizations. And uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we've only been able to help a handful, as with Bill Grow and, and Unlimited. And, and some of us are not traditional incubators or accelerators. So there, there is sort of a mishmash of what's um, starting to grow and improve, I think, in India. Um, from the perspective of Dasra, Rajesh, we have a program called Dasra Social Impact. And that's where we bring in um, entrepreneurs to work on their business plans and to help them pitch and provide a little bit of that disconnect in language uh, with the investors. But you know, that being said, I think, you know, not to drag back to the financing conversation, but the title in essence really brings it home. The investors are not prepared to take the kind of risk that these social enterprises are facing. And it's really about the environments that they're working in and the business models that they are are inherently challenging for them to execute and investors are just not willing to deal with some of that uncertainty. So I don't think the disconnect is as simple as a language issue or as simple as Vinod was saying that it's the fund size. This, the challenge of the fact is that many of the social enterprises are actually smaller than the fund size out there. So sometimes the economics, Vinod, hello? Sometimes the economics. <laughs> 
sometimes the economics actually don't work either. But, but in terms of the capacity build in, building and the incubator piece, I do think there's a need to provide that kind of support, especially if you're looking on the social side. I mean, Gaurav is a sophisticated, you know, he can get a business done. But if you see some of the entrepreneurs, they're not coming from many of the backgrounds that you know, the traditional commercial, commercial side comes with. And so they need a significant amount of handholding, not only in language, but also sort of on strategy and what will be successful. For me, the big question becomes, who pays for this? Who pays for the incubator? And, in, and there lies in the conversation around what's the role of philanthropy. And you brought up venture philanthropy. And I think you know, from Dasra's perspective, we see a growing role for philanthropy to play until the investors decide to take the risk. And so some of the philanthropy de-risks a lot of these potential investments, but we need to start creating more momentum around um, that piece. And of course, we'll get to it, but the policy structure and frameworks don't allow, don't really promote grant funding into these kinds of organizations. But the challenge for most of us incubators and accelerators is we can barely ask the social entrepreneurs to pay I mean, they're barely paying themselves. And it goes a little bit to yours, and I know I'm taking a lot of time. You can't get an investment banker or a CFO. None of them want to be paid what these organizations can afford. And so it's a chicken or the egg, right? Give me the funding. Yeah, outsource, but who, who no one's doing it. So we've talked at thus far, let's have a shared CFO concept. No one wants to pay for the shared CFO. So the, it's there in the commercial side. It's not there on the social enterprise side. And so many of you guys on the commercial side just need to start thinking about what's going to work from the economics point of view on the social side, given we're all working on smaller pieces. But basically, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's a growing incubator accelerator world. And I think we do need to learn from different countries that have done this successfully. But a lot of our challenge and the question for us is who, who pays for that support? So, so Randall, I think you represent the the largest entrepreneurship network, uh, Aspen. So yeah. we'd like to just hear your views on this. I think Nira should pay for it all personally. <laughs> um, so let, me, let me make two comments. One, on the, the value and, and the types of incubation services that work. Um, at Andy and in my previous job at the US Council on Competitiveness, I've had a chance to look at a variety of different uh, support models for entrepreneurs. And I would say that the ones that I have seen to be most successful always had at least two different elements that I think need to be emulated. The first is that there needs to be a coach. So it is the idea that each entrepreneur, and ideally that the management team of the social entrepreneurship group has access to a coach that understands their industry, understands what it's like, and is aligned with their particular stage of development. That's often found um, alone. What's best is when the coaching takes place within a peer group. So what you want is to have a team of entrepreneurs that are at about the same stage, the same level, um, that may be in different industries, so they're not competing with each other, but facing the same kinds of growth challenges, and a coach that can work with the entire team. So to me, that's the, the, the highest standard you can get. And when, as I talk to the social entrepreneurs out there, that's what you should be looking for when you decide where you're going to be incubated if you have a choice. Um, and that. And then um, the other thing I would say is just in terms of the funding, there are a variety of models out there, and there are in fact funds. Um, there's one named Ignea, which is in Mexico, which does have the shared services. So part of their model, um, and they're a for-profit fund, they actually think it's in their best interest to have on staff, and in fact they require their investee companies to use the back office accounting, the back office HR, and the back office finance support that's provided by this one shared service unit. So they're not actually getting any outside support for it. I'm not suggesting that other models it wouldn't be fine to have state provide some of that. But there are ways in which you can build that into your cost structure, uh, which ultimately, if you're right, will end up um, paying back off with higher returns uh, when you exit the investments. So uh, Gaurav, as an entrepreneur, how do you respond to this? Would you like to avail of uh, such a model, I mean, where you have shared services for your finance position, for your HR position? So I, I think I would completely echo both Dira's and Randall's points because the struggle, before I answer your question, is actually, you know, trying to get human resources in this space is, um, you know, we are operating in a space which is more environment. So that means you need better people, I mean, you need the best of the best to join such a space. Getting that done is impossible. 
I mean, we cannot pay for it. I mean, you will only find people either at the later, later parts of their careers who will say, okay, I'll spend a couple of days with you, mentor you, or maybe groom a junior person. That's the model we've been using. And we were fortunate to you know, have, um, I think to your point, that we have had, we were fortunate to have Shell Foundation play that role. They give us access to some of the senior people. And uh, we were very fortunate to have that from the, in and that's sort of our coaching network. In terms of the corporate side, you know, we were similarly, you know, we were paired up with two large MNCs, Coke and Unilever, who, who gave us that industry knowledge. But to your question on the shared services, this has worked in the PE space um, very well. I mean, general for the for-profit PE space, I mean, in general Atlantic, we used to have something like this. So yes, if this is available, we would be you know, taking it with open arms, to be honest. But I mean, I, I just see, feel that the social space is, I mean, the Mexican, I think it's Mexican, right? That example is a great one, but India doesn't have something like this. If we can maybe come together and do it, I think it would be in the interest of of solving the social needs, uh, which we're all trying to do. So I would, I mean, welcome that. And, you know, maybe something can be done out of this panel. Sure, so shared services seems to be a model that's, that's uh, great, I think. Uh, but, but you've led us to, your, to, our, to the next uh, key issue, really, that we, have, we had identified, which is that of talent acquisition. So most startups that we have interacted with seem to face that issue, and I think that is a quote by almost all the funds universally. And uh, uh, no entrepreneur seems to have, a, have an answer to the problem of talent acquisition. It's always been a challenge, and it continues to be a challenge for 95% of the people that we meet. Uh, Neera, in your experience with the entrepreneurs, uh, do you, have you seen any other model work? How do you actually make people acquire talent? How do you have entrepreneurs acquire talent? I mean, that's a challenging question. Um, I think that entrepreneurs themselves have to come into programs and there have to be more programs that are available for them for training, all the way from sort of professional development to, to leadership uh, to, you know, a bunch of different skills. I think the challenge for them is time, right? Where, where do you bring out the time to be able to improve your own skills? And so then the next question becomes, okay, then bring on the talent that's missing within the organization. I think what many entrepreneurs need to think through is what is the kind of talent and skill sets that they do need um, to make their businesses successful. And sometimes it's difficult for them to take a step back and think through what's the ideal organizational structure, what is the kind of talent I need, and therefore go out and bring those people or you know, invest in individuals that are currently within their organization. And I think sometimes they don't ha you don't have enough time to do that. Um, but you should really evaluate what you have on board um, and how you can build that and leverage that because you are cash strapped. So, so I do think uh, that's challenging um, to upskill all the time. Um, I think having forums or like Randall was saying, environments where you can interact with your peers. So that's where Social Impact's the program that brings that peer learning together and that helps people take a step back and be able to, to skill themselves and learn um, from each other. But in general, there needs to be a more supportive environment and safe spaces for entrepreneurs to come and think about upskilling. I think business schools need to start thinking about specialized programs for social entrepreneurs because, you know, a plain vanilla MBA or executive education doesn't actually provide the kind of support that they need. So I think academic institutions need to start thinking about providing these shorter term affordable kinds of um, things. I think the Andy network, um, you know, a global network leverages a bunch of different people all around the world. So be, being able to bring more and more resources to these entrepreneurs that's affordable, I think, is, is one way, but it's clearly a challenge. Sure. Richard, would you like to comment on this, uh, uh, given that you work with around 40 enterprises? So is this uh, something that uh, you provide and in, in your research of other incubators that you found in the ecosystem? So is that a challenge that incubators typically address, and, and how do you address these challenges? So what I'd add to what uh, Nira said is uh, we see entrepreneurs at very early stages of their personal and organizational life cycle. So the first thing that we do our best to do is work on the entrepreneur's awareness of themselves as a leader. And that, that awareness includes really understanding that they can't do everything themselves and they need to bring other people on board to fill in 
the, the skill areas that they're less good at. So that's the first stage. Um, and then at the later stage of our portfolio, a later stage of development, then we do our best to try and help the entrepreneurs find those individuals. And I think I, we don't have all the answers as to where these individuals will come from. They've come from multiple sources. They've come from sometimes from uh, interns filling th those positions for, or interim people filling those positions. Um, but it's something that we want to improve our support on. Sure. So, uh, so it seems like uh, there are some solutions that address both the financing and the non-financing side, but uh, we were, uh, I think there has been a lot of debate on how the, how the policy can actually uh, be changed to support this entrepreneurship ecosystem and, and be more enabling than what it is currently. And uh, uh, I think in India, there have been debates in the past about uh, the equivalence of the benefit corporation in the US, the B Corp and the CIC in the UK, uh, which talk about specific social enterprise status as a legal entity, which is more of a hybrid between a for-profit and a non-profit. And uh, uh, there have been efforts in the recent months to, uh, to advocate such a structure in India. And, uh, and uh, Neera, if you can uh, talk about the work that you have done. That you have put together a concept note uh, for the creation of such a legal entity in India. Uh, if you can just talk about uh, what that is and, and how it can help the entrepreneurship ecosystem, especially the social enterprises. We sure, sure. So um, the, I, I'm sure many of you know that the company bill was up for suggestions and um, a group of us had met as entrepreneurs and other intermediaries at the Action Forum for India, which was this platform to bring entrepreneurs together and suggest to Mr. Sam Petroda, who's the chairman of the National Innovation Council, what could be done to kind of make the ecosystem stronger, but what could we really do to help these enterprises, you know, scale. And the conversation came up sort of how do we really overcome some of the legal issues that exist right now that really don't allow a lot of capital to come through to these organizations in the form that they, that they need. And so a group of us said, let's get together and let's write something and suggest an amendment to the company's bill. Uh, and Pankaj's alumni firm, AZB and Zia Modi, helped us with a lot of the legal language to sort of put together. And you know, the crux of this was, can we offer up a Section 25A company, which is uh, an entity that can allow for entry of blended capital, as in they could take in grant, they could take in debt, and they could take in equity. And some of the suggestions that we made were like, capping the dividend so that basically these social enterprises can enable, we can enable the financing environment up to a certain point because of course the government and bureaucrats are worried that, you know, we don't want them to become too big. The second they're going to start growing and become, you know, more commercially viable, they move out of this entity. But I think that the reason that it's important to bring, that I, we thought it was important to talk about this is that there just needs to be a stronger voice uh, for entrepreneurs. I mean, that's really what Dasra believes and I think you know, many of you will also agree that when we went to do this, we didn't actually have a united platform to lobby. You have to go to the parliamentary committee and speak to different people. And there isn't an organization or, or a platform that does that. And I think there has been some discussions here at Sunculp about uh, the creation of NACE. I think some of you have signed on for, you know, a, a national platform for entrepreneurs to come together. But the reason that I bring this up is that there do need to be policy changes to enable and help social enterprises scale, to allow for investors to take more risk. And all of that does require us to interact a little bit more with the government. And I think if all of you can think about a way of coming together, I think that sort of helps the movement. Um, and sort of that was part of our, from our perspective, an important piece. Pankaj, you have uh, worked on this and of course incorporated the legal language on some of this. In the US, the B Corp talks about uh, specific criteria of a social enterprise. And uh, I think people are struggling here to lay out a framework and trying to understand and define these terms. Uh, in the US, they talk about the vision of the company, talking about a positive social and environmental impact. And uh, they also talk about expansion of duties of directors to incorporate the social and the environmental aspects. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how uh, these changes of policy can be advocated and what kind of, uh, what, I mean, 
frameworks can be put together and uh, how the enterprise can be defined. So interestingly, law is a species which is always condemned to play catch up with social innovation. And if you look at the history of evolution of how social enterprises get regulated all over the world, uh, the Western world has been at the forefront, at the thought lead, at the forefront of the thought leadership uh, movement in terms of coming up with interesting structures where you can have for-profit entities which are also allowed to raise grants, where shareholders and directors will not be running afoul of the law if profit maximization is not the intent. Because if you look at the conventional jurisprudence around corporate law, a board of directors is uh, supposed to be the f uh, have a fiduciary duty to maximize the interests of the shareholder. And typically, it's understood to mean economic interest, which means that profit maximization in a for-profit conventional form is supposed to be the mantra. But there has been a lot of movement around double bottom line, triple bottom line, about bringing in additional stakeholders, uh, wherein other additional legal structures have been evolved, which can ra uh, raise both commercial capital versus grant capital, wherein it is OK for board of directors to not only focus on financial bottom line, but even focus on uh, double bottom line or triple bottom line. Now, insofar as India is concerned, uh, all I can say is that this is a classic case where there's a lag between the catch-up with social innovation. Uh, I distinctly remember in last February when I turned entrepreneur and I was driving down the streets of Delhi, uh, there was a hoarding put up by one of the leading financial dailies on ch news channels, I believe, which, which was February of last year, just before the budget was about to come, which went to the effect, Mr. Finance Minister, let's help more startups start up. Uh, which for me was a very, very poignant and equally amusing uh, tagline just before the budget is about to come. And funnily enough, exactly one year down the line in this year's budget, as most of you may or may not know, there is a stipulation around something what the media is calling the startup tax, which is to say if uh, 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 in early stage enterprises are raising money from resident uh, angel investors or resident investors who don't qualify as a registered venture capital uh, fund or otherwise, uh, any value which is more than the fair market value, and fair market value is something which is extremely subjective, left to the discretion of the government, uh, the company will have to pay tax on it because it will be treated as income from other sources. And even though the government introduces such kind of a provision in all benign intent, uh, in all fairness, to prevent money laundering and to prevent abuses, which a lot of my brethren and chartered accountants perpetrate, uh, but it also ended up being a classic example of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because what ends up happening in a situation like this is, like I've, I was referring to earlier, angel money is the lifeblood of putting together a very robust entrepreneurial ecosystem and more importantly, providing a very good pipeline for your early stage VC funds or even later stage VC funds. And that's how the cycle goes on. And a, 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 a introduction of such a measure like this is something which if comes out in the form and manner that it is originally proposed will be short-sighted. But again, based on a lot of representation, at least the government has been understanding and what we are given to understand, hopefully it is not going to be the case and they're probably going to introduce an exception, which hopefully will be uh, uh, beneficial for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, insofar as choices of legal entities are concerned, Atreya, to answer your specific question, uh, I think India is quite well poised in terms of uh, having entrepreneurs, the right kind of legal entity to start up. Because I'm a big fan of weaving around legal entity based on your business model rather than the other way around. And legal entities are not an end, end in themselves. They're a means to an end in terms of fostering entrepreneurship. But the kind of initiative which Anira has also taken in terms of having that kind of a genuinely hybrid entity, which will raise both hybrid and commercial, I think that's a step in the right direction. Thanks, Pankaj. Randall, you want to add something here? Well, well, I guess I would, I think, reinforce your point which is it doesn't matter whether you're a B Corp, an S Corp, a Z Corp, an EDF Corp. If you don't have a good business model, if you don't have proof that you're going to, or not proof, but at least a good argument that you're going to have the social impact and, and economic return, it really doesn't matter. And so is it a positive step to have this additional form? Might that draw in a little bit of additional capital here in India and the world? Yes, it's a good thing. But, but to my social entrepreneur friends out there, your business form is not going to get you capital. It's going to be your business that gets you capital. And you need to really focus hard on that. Rajesh, would you agree with that? See, uh, obviously, there are a lot of uh, 
angles to it. But I think uh, from the practical uh, perspective of the information that you can use, you know, uh, two, three things are very important. One is uh, we must understand the relationship between scalable vision, debt versus equity, and growing through collaboration. Okay, So if your vision is very exciting, that is what uh, I mean by scalable vision, whether you are a social enterprise or whether you are a commercial enterprise, you will get support. Okay, Now how do we get that support? So difference between debt and equity, you must understand that debt is past performance and equity is future promise. Okay, And a lot of uh, enterprises in their initial stage, they do not understand this difference, you know, and hence they also don't know when to leverage what. Okay. Debt restricts you from going, growing because it is based on your past performance. So if you are earning 100 rupees, so maximum financing, let's say you'll get for 60, 70 rupees, and that restricts how much you can grow. Equity is future promise. You may be un earning 100 rupees right now, but if you have a scalable vision or a business plan, which can allow you to grow to 1,000 or 10,000, right? It's possible that even if you are earning 100 rupees right now, you can get 1,000 rupees funded or 2,000 rupees funded, right? So that's, that's the difference between debt and equity, and hence uh, the smaller enterprises in particular should understand this power of equity. So if you have a scalable vision, you can raise money far beyond what your present capacity is. The third point, and interestingly what you brought out that, you know, the smaller enterprises may not even have CFOs or people to work on, right? Or resources to work on, or how do they hire people? The third important thing is growing through collaboration, okay? So I agree, you may not have even resources to pay the salaries or whatever. So in that case today, because the market understands equity, you can grow through collaboration. So let's say, for example, I need uh, to hire the services of a consulting company or I need to hire the services of a CA firm or a legal firm, right? And I do not have the money to pay them because I'm at a very initial stage, right? If your vision is very exciting, can you go across to that firm and say, boss, I don't have money to pay you, right? But if you advise me and if, uh, or if you give me this input, I'll give you 5% of my equity in the company, right? Will you be willing to work with me, right? Chances are they may because if you have a exciting growth story ahead, they would like to participate in it. And instead of taking the fee in cash at that point of time, they may uh, agree to collaborate with you, you know. So this is how for uh, in even Dubai was made, you know, like uh, Dubai was, was just a desert, you know, they, uh, unlike their neighbors, they didn't even have uh, oil uh, resources. So it was a poor desert state country, right? But they came up with a great vision of building Dubai as the international city, right? And then they sold that vision to the world and money came in, resources came in, people came in, everything came in through collaboration route, you know. So they gave stake to everybody, right. So today it's possible and especially very relevant for very small enterprises who do not have even the basic resources to go out and reach out and spend that uh, bare minimum am uh, amount, that grow through collaboration. Anything is possible. So let's say even if you come up with a big plan that I want to build a five-star hotel in opposite of this five-star hotel, right, but I don't have money, you still can do that through collaboration. So let's say the landowner, you go to him and say, boss, this is my vision, you know, so I can give you this much return on this. Thing. Are you willing to contribute your land and I'll give you so much uh, equity in return for that? So apart from the financial instruments, I think this collaboration as an instrument can be very powerful for smaller enterprises to raise money. Like for example, we at Times of India, we do exactly the same thing, right? So a lot of these smaller enterprises, they have great ideas, they have great growth stories but they do not have the money to spend on advertising to build the brand, right? So we say, okay, we'll help you build the brand and in, instead we'll take a 5% stake. Like even Salman Khan has, uh, you know, taken a stake in uh, Yatra.com, for example. So I don't know what's the exact mechanisms of it, right? He's also the brand ambassador. But I'm saying through collab collaboration, it is possible to grow even if you are on short on resources. And the basic es essential thing is that you must have a vision which is exciting, whether you are in the social space or whether in your commercial space, because that is what will propel the external entities to believe in you and to collaborate with you and grow along with you. Thanks, Rajesh. So you represent a fund that uh, has pioneered non-cash investment here. So I think that's a great idea. So non-cash investment, venture debt, venture philanthropy, equity. Uh, I'll now open the panel out for questions, so.
Anyone awake? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, for the panel discussion, we heard uh, more about equity, equity. But what about debt? If equity is very difficult, and if there are many funds and people can't access those funds, uh, nobody spoke about debt. And what are the challenges when somebody speaks about debt? Uh, I'll, I'll answer as you know to the best of my knowledge. I know that you know every startup thinks that there's no debt available. There is, and and it's slowly developing. It's still early days. Uh, startup companies, no collateral, which is typically what venture debt is, are getting. I mean, there is a company here called Intelligro, which does that. So th there are others, Kinara also, which does it. So debt is slowly coming and, and being available. But to your point, there may not be enough available. But it is available. But most of it is predicated on, on the assumption that you are going to go out and raise further equity. Because without that equity, how are you really going to leverage your, I mean, what is there to leverage? There's no balance sheet. So that becomes an issue for anybody on the other side who's trying to provide debt. So if, but if you have something or you're already raising uh, equity, yeah, then there is debt available. There are various forms of debt available. But it's, it's still early stages, but it's coming, for, coming up really fast. If I could just add, I, I, um, I've been spending a lot of time with banks, commercial banks, in the last couple of weeks. And let me just assure you, uh, as a non-banker, uh, they're not nearly as interesting or as fun as you social entrepreneurs. So it's been painful. Um, and here's what they say about you. They say that you're too young, you don't have any experience, that you're too small, you're not really big enough, and you're really expensive to serve because you're small. Um, and they say um, that you're too poor, you don't have any collateral. So you're poor, you're young, um, you're inexperienced, you're small, and they don't lend. They say, ultimately, you're too risky. And they're right, except if I ask you to close your eyes, 30 years ago, if you had to pick, who was more likely to get funding from a bank? A single person business owned by an illiterate woman who's never gone to school, or an existing firm owned by a woman with five employees that has been working in, you know, for three to four years and produces something. So if we can figure out microfinance, we should be able to figure out how to do small business lending. And the good news is there are actually new products and services that are being generated by banks around the world. Um, there's some cash flow based lending that's being done based by psychometric testing, where literally you take a test, it's been developed by Harvard, which you may want to not like, but throw out, don't trust those Harvard guys. Um, but literally, banks are making cash flow based loans based upon someone's likelihood of payback, which is being done by a test. So that, that's being done by Standard Bank all throughout Africa. They're trying it in Latin America now. It's still uncertain. But I want to give you some hope that banks recognize that there is an un, uh, untapped market opportunity. You have non-bank financial institutions that are already doing this. And hopefully, we'll go to where the money is, and the banks will actually get on board using new models that will serve small businesses. But you also must be very careful for, with debt, because you know, it comes with liability to pay back. Okay? And uh, a lot of uh, large companies also, you know, in down times, when the business is not generating enough returns, they just get wiped out because of the huge debt burdens that they've taken. Okay? So in growth times, debt could be a cheaper uh, source of money. But in down times, or in uncertain times, debt could be a very expensive form of taking money. Can I just, can I just quickly add? Um, just to answer your question, we've started on a very small level providing debt uh, at about the 20 lakh level. Um, in response to the needs that the entrepreneurs that we serve came to us with, and they said we need, very much uh, echoing what Randall has said, we need um, cheap debt, we need patient debt, and we need debt that comes with support. And that's what we're trying to provide. Uh, I have a quick, quick question. Uh, in most of the due diligence, I found enormous focus given for the financial metrics. And uh, what is the rigor used in assessing your social returns? I know there are, there are reporting standards like IRIS and so on. 
What is the rigor? I've never found it in any of the due diligence thus far. Um, as, as a venture fund and also as an angel investor, um, being part of IAN and a whole bunch of other networks, yes, you are right that there's a fair amount of emphasis on the financial aspects. Uh, but Avishkar, for example, you know, we actually go out and look at the social and the environmental impact of the business. I mean, the business has to be viable because unless it's viable, it can't be sustainable. If it's not sustainable, it can't necessarily have an impact. But then, having said that, we actually go out and actually go out and, and look at environmental and social impact, and we actually measure it. And there is an analysis done by our team which actually looks at that and actually makes a report, and that is actually part of our own recommendations that we make to our investment committee when the investment committee actually approves or disapproves our investment. Uh, so, so let's, uh, uh, sorry, it's a follow-up. If you take the financial and social returns, what's the kind of weightage you give between them? I, I would say, I mean, yeah, social may not necessarily be at the same level as, as financial is, but it's, it's fairly important. Uh, it may not necessarily be, if, if you compare it, you know, it may not be 10 out of 10, but I'm, I'm sure it's between 7 and 8. But I mean, I think you bring up a good point in general. I'm just going to, I'm going to make a suggestion because it's important for everybody who are entrepreneurs out there to think about this is that there isn't enough of a conversation about what social outcomes are, and some of it is because the investing side really doesn't care. Um, but I think as you're gonna see more and more social investors are going to require some reporting on the social side. And so um, many of you have heard about Gin. I think Gin presented here. Um, you know, we throw Iris and Pulse and all these things out there. I think as a community, we need to think about creating standardization across social metrics. And the more that you guys do it on your side and there's a common language to talk about social outcomes, we can convince the investors that there is actually social outcome. And therefore, we'll start building more of a funding base that's going to require you to be more accountable on that. So what we see from our philanthropists, where, so we see it's more likely to have a grant giver push more towards the social investing side. But there's still this, the, as soon as the question of a return comes in, whether it's patient or low or whatever, they want more accountability still on the social side. So I think as a community, we need to think about how to do it. And maybe Randall at some point can talk about. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean you, you were talking about measuring social impact. We do that also on an annual basis. I mean, we go out and look at across our portfolio. And we publish that. We publish the impact that our investments and our portfolio companies have had on the environment and, and in society. And that's published. And that's you know, given a fair amount of publicity. And that's also something that our investors really look forward to. So our investors, even though they say they need commercial returns, are also looking at that. that. So going back to what Neera was saying, yeah, the commercial investors may not necessarily have that much of an emphasis. But then some of us, like Avishkar and funds like us, are paying more, much more attention to that. And I think there's a lot more emphasis on measuring social and environmental impact. Yeah. Uh, one last I question. Seems connected. to be told that time is up, but uh, one, one, one question. Do we have time? Uh, Rajesh mentioned in the beginning uh, that, you know, what you're really looking at where the business will make money and you will make money. And uh, one of the things that most people miss out is what is your exit plan? So if it's a social enterprise, I mean, uh, we have been, I've been listening about uh, um, special exchanges being set up with triple bottom line is uh, the way the valuations will go. That was very active in the last uh, summit. This summit, I'm not hearing much about that, you know, special stock exchanges being set up with three bottom lines. So what is the exit route available for social enterprises if somebody invests money at the current uh, uh, disposition? I'll try, I'll try to be brief as I know we need to, to finish. First of all, there are a lot of activities still on the social stock exchange front. The Asia, uh, Impact of Asia Exchange is developing. There's one called Nexi, which is based in South Africa that's global. There's one in London. There's one in New York. None of them have done really anything significant yet. We don't know which ones are going to make it. We don't know which ones are going to survive. But that model is growing. It will be tested, and it will be coming to you soon. Today, the answer is it's owner buyback. And so you structured at the beginning that that's how you get out as an investor. B, there are some sales occasionally in the space. Um, and then someday we really do hope, again, we'll get to the point where you can list 
some way or the other, or you can have an active secondary market. Um, and also, there is a growing amount of focus on retail investors. Maybe not in India, but uh, Kiva, which has been so important in microfinance, is trying to do crowdfunding, um, where you're just paying them back for their investment, um, which is debt, essentially. Um, and um, there are also other groups. Uh, Trilink Global is another one in the United States, which is trying to bring in more retail investors. Yet. Um, but there are going to be more and more exit opportunities for investors. Thank you, Atreya. Thank you, panelists. Small token of appreciation. And great job. We managed. One hour, ten minutes. <laughs>